Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. So for those of you who are still filtering in, we'd like to ask that you take a seat so we can start on time. We have a lot to cover tonight, so we'd like to get started and be respectful of your time as well since you chose to attend tonight. So my name is Ellen Zappo Sasu. I am the relatively new town manager here in Enfield and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight and to introduce to you two of our community leaders, our mayor, Bob Crisati, and the chairwoman of the Board of Education, Tina LeBlanc, who are gonna welcome you as well. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to welcome everybody here today. Uh, my name is Mayor Bob Crisati, and along with me is the Board of Ed Chair, Tina LeBlanc. I'd like to recognize uh, a few people that are in attendance here today. Uh, our town council members that are in attendance, uh, Deputy Mayor Gina Sakala, Councilor Santanella, Councilor Hopkins, Councilor Finger, and Councilor Ungeyer. I would also like to uh, recognize State Representative Tom Arnone, who's in the house today. I would also like to mention uh, our town staff that are in attendance today. Our town manager who did introduce both of us uh, a couple of minutes ago, Ellen Zappu-Sasu, who's doing a fantastic job here in the town of Enfield. Our assistant town manager, Steve Belinda, is in attendance. Social service director, Cindy Guerreri. Uh, Enfield police chief, uh, Alaric Fox. And Captain Kazlowskis is here also. Also, uh, I did see from the library services, Jason McNeely, so we'd like to welcome uh, everybody here. I'm happy to see you all here today. At the last census, Enfield came in with a little over 42,000 in population. Of this number, we have 23% of our population that are people of color. 6% are African American, 2% are Asian, 10% are Latino, and 5% are other ethnicities. More importantly, our white baby boomers are aging and are being replaced by younger generations who are driving the increase in diversity, especially the black and Latino populations. As our community changes, we must change with it. Tonight is a starting point for that, and I'm looking forward to listening in to the groups. I also see uh, members of other groups that are here that I would like to recognize some of the groups that are here. Our surge group, which is the showing up for racial justice is here tonight. Our Ujima group, matter of fact, we had se celebrated the Juneteenth here in town, along with our pride group, which celebrated uh, the pride month, and also KITE, uh, the key initiative to early education. And this fall, they are going to be instituting the DEI model, the diversity, equity, and inclusion. Also want to recognize all of the members of our faith community. Um, so I'd like to welcome everybody and thank you for uh, showing, showing up tonight. And right now, I'd like to introduce our Board of Ed Chair, Tina LeBlanc. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome to Enfield High School for this community conversation. As Bob said, I am uh, the chair of the board, Tina LeBlanc. I would like to recognize other members of the Board of Ed who are here this evening. Um, we have Jonathan LeBlanc, secretary, Scott Ryder, vice chair, Mr. John Ungeyer, minority leader. We also have in attendance Amanda Pickett, Josh Hamry, Dr. Kalnan, Gina Cree, and Janet Cushman, welcome. Uh, just as a side note, we do have a regularly scheduled board meeting at 7 p.m., so the Board of Ed um, folks are going to be scooting out to head to that meeting at Town Council. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this point, I would like to bring back up our town manager, uh, Ellen Zapusasu, who will do our next introduction. Thank you, everyone. So before we meet, Kamora Harrington, who will be our facilitator, 
facilitator tonight. I would like to have our chief of police come up and offer a brief greeting as well, since they're gonna be integral to our conversation tonight. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and as you heard uh, from everyone that preceded me, please allow us to extend, please allow me to extend the sincerest of thank yous to all of you for taking time out of your hectic, busy, day-to-day, -day, there's a lot going on schedules, to come out and take part in this discussion. I believe, sincerely, that the Enfield Police Department enjoys a very positive relationship with this community, and that doesn't just happen. That exists because of how well you treat the folks that I work with, and I like to think that exists because of how our officers, in turn, police this community. You very rightfully set high expectations for the men and women of the Enfield Police Department, and I, with pride, struggle to ensure that those expectations are met. Tonight, is a part of that discussion. I am here this evening, and my command staff is here this evening, primarily to listen, primarily to listen to those areas of concern that you have in this subject area that might either directly impact law enforcement operations or have the tendency to sort of bump up against law enforcement operations. But I'm here tonight for a second reason as well, and I will tell you I share this with a certain degree of trepidation. I've been a police officer now for 39 years. I've been an attorney for 31 years. And I'm also in a position this evening to share with you, to the very best of my ability, what the law provides for, at least to the extent that the evening takes us in a direction of the discussion of the events of August 13th. We might not like what those answers are, but I do have a comfort level that I can share that information with you to the extent that you find it beneficial now, later on, in smaller group fashions, or tomorrow in a telephone call or an email. Allow me to end where I started. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Chief. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Kamora Harrington, who is a presenter of many different aspects of uh, community conversations uh, for us starting at this point and very early in these conversations in Enfield, um, there is a term that you're gonna hear tonight that she's gonna help define, and it is cultural humility. It was an interesting term for me when I was reviewing her materials, and I think that you too tonight will find it an interesting starting point for the conversation. But right before we started tonight, um, one of our attendees said, well, why are we here? What are we gonna get out of tonight? And really that is an open-ended question. For parents of children of color or biracial children, you may be here looking for assurances that your children are safe in this community and that they're supported. Uh, I'm hoping that there's parents here who are hoping to have some best practices about how to have these conversations at home. I see a lot of Board of Education elected members here. I also see a lot of school staff here because they're here to support the kids as well. Overall, it's a conversation that's going to be open-ended. There really is no best practice, there's no blueprint for these conversations, but it's also one that is not just tonight and over. There will be continuing small groups, there will be other conversations. Uh, one that the chief and I talk about frequently along with the um, leadership of the town council is our opioid situation and substance misuse. That is a whole nother community conversation, but sometimes some of these community conversations will intersect. So this format is new for Enfield, but I think it's one where we break into smaller groups that we're gonna feel comfortable. We're gonna get to know our neighbors, our coworkers, people that you may not have met before. And that really is the beginning part of any conversation. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kamora Harrington to join us so she can tell you a little bit about herself and what we're doing. She actually grew up in the neighboring town of Summers, which gives her some great perspective. She is currently a regional presenter and uh, well-renowned for these types of facilitation. I recently attended one for her that she did in a neighboring community and found it to be just really thought-provoking. And thank God when I called her with about 48 hours notice, she was available tonight because I do believe that it's important for us as town leaders, elected officials to listen and not actually be facilitating. It's, it's hard to do both. So I'd like to welcome her and give her the microphone so she can tell us about what we're gonna be doing from this point forward.
Okay, thank you so much for inviting me into your community. My name is Kamora Liela Harrington. I'm a cultural humility educator. I have been doing this, uh, I've been doing this for over 30 years. I am probably a lot older than most of you think I am. And, and I wanna share one of the things that I think is beautiful. So, so one of the things you just heard is yes, I grew up in Summers, Connecticut. And these are conversations that I have been having since the early 70s. And for a very, very, very long time, white people were not having these conversations. And then spaces started happening and white people started having the conversations, but we still kept them very, very nice. And one of the reporters who I spoke to before we got in here, we were talking about what's tonight going to look like, what's, tonight, what's tonight's conversation going to look like, what can we expect? What you can expect this evening before you even get started is respect. You can expect respect for your voice, but I need you to understand that this is not a safe space for your voice. One thing that we've done for a really long time, and it's been really, really nice, we've created these beautiful safe spaces, right? And I can come in and I can spout my racist rhetoric, and it's going to be okay because it's a safe space. I can spout my homophobic rhetoric, and it's gonna be okay because it's a safe space. Right now, I'm respecting everyone in this space to step into their highest self, to be their best self, and do better. We are going to do much better. We are going to say things that we might not think are the right thing to say, but it's a question that we've got and we're going to share it. And you're going to be challenged. The conversation that we're going to have this evening in order for growth to happen, I'm not going to tell you sad stories of racism so that we can all shake our heads and look at each other and make it quite clear to each other that we have better values than those horrible people out there who would do racist acts and we can leave here understanding that we're good caring people because nothing changes at that point. We are going to talk about what it feels like to realize you're looking at a 12-year-old black boy when you thought you were looking at a 30-year-old menacing black man. We're going to talk about the discomfort when your neighbor says, well, you know, <laughs> what do you expect? They were kind of on his lawn. And we're gonna talk about what happened inside of you at that moment when you didn't say anything. And we're going to discuss why you didn't say anything. So, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for inviting me. This is one of those fun places. So I've been doing this. I'm from Connecticut, grew up in Summers, grew up in Hartford. I love going around. And one of the things that I think is a benefit for, t for you tonight is I'm the crazy lady from outside. I'm here, I'm the neighbor. Guess what? You've got cobwebs in the corners that you didn't see until I stepped in the door, at which point you now know you got cobwebs. I'm going to leave, clean up the cobwebs. And then the beautiful part, what are you gonna do? So the next step, people who are wondering what are we gonna do this evening, spend the next, and we've got a little bit less than 90 minutes, we've lost some time, but spend the next 90 minutes of your life thinking about what's gonna happen next week. In here, we're here, we care. Some of us care a whole lot, some of us care a whole little bit, but we're all here because we care. And that means there's a responsibility on you. So hello, welcome to the work of cultural humility. Cultural competency told us that we were so incredibly great and magnanimous in ourselves that we could learn so much about you, and you, and you, that we were then qualified to go out and take care of people and work with people. Has that worked in the last 30 years? It has not. We just send people to mandatory trainings. They hate those trainings, and they come back just hating people even more. Those trainings suck. Cultural humility asks us all to look at ourselves. Cultural humility demands. I am the greatest thing since sliced bread. Check it out. I hold amazing failings and great shortcomings, and I own those as well. Both of those truths are, are true simultaneously at all times, and my job is to figure out how to reduce myself so I can show up in space with you, and we can actually get something done. Um, honestly, here's the end goal. Climate change, this earth is going through a whole lot. And the United States of America, we, this wonderful American racism, this American whiteness, has created a place that we can't get to the real problem. So, in the next 90 minutes of our lives, we are going to begin addressing what the heck is going on inside of ourselves that creates a place that we can't get to the humanity of each other and we can't move forward. So, one of the things that I've said about the conversation this evening, and I got the phone call on Friday, um, and thank you so much for inviting me, and yes, I did drop everything. And anyone who is feeling that this is a reactionary meeting, yup, yup, reactionary is necessary. Taking your time, being planful, being reasonable, that's painful. What does that say to a child who's been called a nigger? This thing happened yesterday. You know what? We gotta think about it. You felt a thing. That's too bad, but we don't wanna go being irrational. 
we're going to do something. So when I get these calls, I do drop everything, and I made it quite clear I was going to be available for this. Because one thing, if we are a, if we are a society that believes in any way that we are a caring people, then when a human being in our community is damaged, we drop everything and we say we can't have this. So right now this is reactionary and this reactionary is necessary. Thank you all for showing up. A thing happened, knee-jerk reaction, you showed up. Yup, be proud of it. Mm-hmm, yeah. Now what happens next week? So, welcome to a KCC engagement. Welcome to Brave Space. I want you all to share information. I want you to hold information to yourself. As we're sharing, as we're talking, I really want you to think about why that is. As we talk about creating space for all, we are not asking people to dump and share constantly at all times. We're asking you to kind of think judiciously about who you are and how you share and where you share. So in a little bit, we're gonna be sharing identities, we're gonna be talking about identities. As you're sharing who you are with the people who are next to you, think about what you're sharing and why. I'm a 50-year-old black lesbian with two sons. I like to share that because I kinda like my family. Um, but as you're sharing who you are, what are you sharing and why? As you're not sharing who you are, I'm a 50-year-old lesbian with two sons. What are you not sharing and why? As you're sharing who, who you are, what are you expecting people to receive from that? As you're choosing to not share who you are, why are you not sharing that? As we think about what we're gonna do in, in these conversations, as we step into those conversations, I'm asking everyone to bring themselves as a human being. And we heard there are lots of groups here. I know BLM 860 is in here. Please come, as, when you step into those conversations, share who you are as a human being, share the group that you belong to. Now, um, I know that we've got a good amount of media here, and welcome again, welcome to a KCC engagement. We're gonna talk about what, what is. <sighs> Earlier today, I received a couple texts, a few texts. A bunch of folks sent me the exact same text. And that text shared that the Proud Boys were going to be um, pulling together rides, doing ride share, and bringing people from the Enfield community who didn't have rides here to this event this evening. When I said that we're gonna respect folks, and I said that we're going to step into a place of believing that people are coming with their best self, let's look at that piece of community engagement. And I want people to think about what community is, because one thing that we've gotten wrong when we work at creating community is we work at creating a place where we've got a community with people who look like us, and smell like us, and share values, and share beliefs. This is the United States of America 2022. That ain't gonna happen. It ain't. <sighs> Very often, we like to believe, as long as we're nice to each other, as long as we practice kindness, as long as, you know, we just smile and say, it's really nice to have you in town, Zach then we can get past this racism thing, and it will go away. We can kind of just ignore it away. It's not going to go away. <sighs> I want to thank the Proud Boys for understanding that this conversation had to happen in their community tonight. And anyone who brought people, anyone who did any ride sharing to bring people here, I want to thank you for doing this, and I'm going to ask you to bravely step into a conversation. One thing that happens often, one thing that we've definitely seen in the last few years in this country, is that we polarize and views that are not socially acceptable in certain spaces don't make it into larger spaces. And then we are all ignorant to each other. And we're not gonna move forward at that point. So, thank you all for coming. If you belong to a group, share that group when we get to your small group. If you don't wanna share it, that's cool too. But please bring your whole self. Bring your age, bring your race, bring your socioeconomic self, bring your education, bring all of yourself into the conversation. And anything that you're leaving out, why is that? Um, so, we do cultural humility. This is going to be all about cultural humility, which means there's no list of things to learn. This all exists in your body. So, right now I've got a microphone in one hand. Can everyone, everyone who's got the ability, can you put your hands out here and give me two beautiful hands? Did everyone, if you didn't grab one of those sheets of paper outside in a minute, okay, here we go. We need everyone to have one of those pieces of paper. Um, the, that gives us the two definitions that we're going to work from. But, for the purposes of the next conversa of the conversation that we're going to have,
Okay, I'm sorry, I needed that. Okay, so everyone has kind of identified a person. Everyone has a bingo sheet. This is what's happening, and this is where we start stepping into brave space. You need to go connect with another human being right now, and your job is to get bingo. Now, I know that the incident happened with the football team, so I'm hoping that we've got some sporty people here. Does anyone here enjoy competition? Yes. Okay, who here cares about winning? Okay, people who care about winning, I need you. You're about to play bingo. You've got a bingo sheet in front of you. Bingo. Wait, you can't, no, you ain't got bingo yet. I don't know who said that, but you ain't got bingo. Your job on that sheet, you've got to get around and talk to people. Now, the first person you need to talk to is that person who looks the least like you. So tall people, find your short person, all that good stuff, right? That's the first person you're going to talk to. And what you need to do, each of you, needs to go find five people, at least five people, so you can get bingo. We all know bingo. Bingo is up, down, there, diagonally. Yeah, we got that, right? Your job is to go get bingo. So, you need to find someone who's been to a pride celebration. You need to find someone who knows Paul, who Paul Robeson is. Paul Robeson's kind of cool, y'all. You need to find someone who enjoys Paul. Go get bingo. Whoever gets bingo first, you shout bingo, and then we're gonna go to some other stuff. But go win. Win, get up, don't do it there.
Elizabeth Winter, come on down. Okay, y'all can all go back to your seats. I won't call you losers because that's a mean thing to say. You're not supposed to say that. Please go back and sit. Okay, sit down. I want to move on because we really don't have a lot of time, but I really, 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 really want to do this case. Okay, first, before we get started, if anyone found an iPhone, please let me know because it's mine. Um, so, yeah, I went to the bathroom, forgot I had an iPhone. But so if anyone finds an iPhone, please let me know. Okay, so I'm here with Liz. Who, who has made it quite clear that she's a big mouth and that has been confirmed by other people who've walked by who've said she's a really big mouth. So, I'm here with Liz. So, and as we start talking about identities, uh, there's, there's this interesting thing, so, it, it, this, this is a whole lot of fun. So, so you're a big mouth, you're a self-identified big mouth? <laughs> yeah, that could be a big mouth. I mean, I'm known for that. What would you like me to do up here? How y'all doing tonight? Huh? Are we ready to make a difference in our town or what? Huh? Long overdue. Let's unite and conquer, baby. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so this one, who I really don't know. So, uh, okay. so let's see. So you got what? The top row across? Yes. Okay. So, so this is this. This I love this game. But one of the fun things about this is I love I love to put them together because it's a way for me to talk about your community. But I'm also a 50 year old lady who kind of grew up in the summer. So that first box up there is me. Who knows the difference between Riverside and Six Flags? Who yeah. what, what, so, someone tell me something. What's the difference? The difference between the signs. Riverside was cheaper and much more fun. Is there is there anyone here who doesn't get this question? Is there anyone who doesn't know that, know what Riverside was? You don't? They're, okay, so we need explanation. There are two people here who appear as if they're probably under 40, right? Yeah, they appear as if they're under 40. So can you please share with us the difference between Riverside and Six Flags? So Riverside was a, an amusement park right where Six Flags was, but it had um, much better rides, less roller coasters, and, and the demolition derby and a racetrack and they did a demolition derby with school buses, yes. which was exciting. <laughs> and, and the wooden roller coaster, which is still there. And uh, Six Flags is a corporate home, and it's all about the money, where Riverside was much more about the fun. Yup. There we are. Um, and we're just gonna bring some ageism and some intergenerational stuff in. When my children go up to Six Flags, I still say they're going up to Riverside. That's what it is. So, and as we have this conversation, quite honestly, when it comes to, to, to words that we use, there are some older black folks who are going to be using Negro. Let them. I am never going to be an African American. Doesn't sit for me. There's a whole lot of people who that is what it is. For some people, Riverside's always going to be Riverside no matter whole, how old and archaic. And when our 16 year old says, Mom, do get with the times, it's Six Flags. I got you. I know Riverside, though. 
So, who has been to a Pride celebration? Uh, it is 2022, it is not 1986. Thank you, do that one more time. Here's the fun part. Who's been to Pride? And your mother knows who went to Pride. <laughs> okay, and this is fun, this is for you. Who's been to Pride? And their pastor knows they've been to Pride. Yeah, there's a power over here, I figured that was a question. Which pastor took people to pride? <laughs> Dude, wait, wait, wait. But now wait, what pride did you go to? You took church people to Atlanta pride? Dude, tell us about it. I, I'm born and raised in, uh, in Georgia, so yeah. The last church that I worked for in Atlanta was uh, St. Mark United Methodist, and we uh, could walk from the church to Piedmont Park. Kind of awesome, old people in the room. That's the world we live in right now. Um, I spent 15 years working with queer teenagers, and it was really, really funny because you got parents, right? And parents understand how incredibly horrible this is, and how their child now has just this awful, like, you're never gonna have friends, you're never gonna have love, you're never gonna have a job, oh my God, your degree is in elementary education, you can't be around kids. <sighs> That's mom who graduated in 1986. We live in a completely different world today where, Pat, and you're out, because it seems like you, no sir, really? Okay. Welcome to 2022. You're out. You took a whole bunch of people to Atlanta Pride. <laughs> so y'all believe in that marriage thing? We were right there. We were right there. Team Roger marriage thing, man. Ah. Okay, so, so Pride is a thing. Here in Connecticut, and again, when we talk about this, this, this tour, like right now I've got this, this community conversation tour going around Connecticut. Pride used to be a thing that happened in New York and in San Francisco, and a couple other places, and that question about does your mama know, a whole lot of people laughed and a whole lot of people felt that. Because pride was a shameful thing that you did in big cities and no one knew. Your employer didn't know, your coworkers didn't know, but you went to do this thing to feel this thing. Today in Connecticut, last year I think we had over 34 prides. More than 34 small communities in Connecticut had pride. And one of the things I think is important about that, talk about creating brave spaces, we can all put on our rainbows and go 400 miles away and be just as gay as the day is long. When we can do it in front of our kindergarten teacher on the town green, then that says something. And when the town green has space for all of her children to show up in the rainbows and say, okay, that's cool, that's great, great, can I have you here? That says a lot. A whole lot of hands went up, a whole lot of people have celebrated Pride, a whole lot of people have been to Pride. Pride is a great party, Pride is a whole lot of fun. <sighs> what the heck is Pride? Um, and again, this is one of those places to think about it afterwards. One thing that we see in many, many places Gay folks are kind of awesome because, you know, I'm one of us. So, gay folks are kind of fabulous and amazing. And one of the things that we are is we're a gift to families. So again, we're gonna continue talking about this, this expansion of self, we're gonna continue talking about identities. And if you've never been challenged in creating difference in your home, in your family, then you are at a loss. If you've had the gift of having your child come out and say, you know what, mom and dad? No, y'all are straight, that's kind of cool. I'm kind of different, and my people have these parties, and my people have this whole other history that you've never heard of, you're being invited into a brand new and beautiful place. So pride is a wonderful thing. Pride started as a riot. I love big city prides. I would never bring a whole lot of people to Atlanta Pride. You are incredibly brave. You're amazing. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that we're seeing is pride is starting to happen in our hometowns which means that our hometowns now need to understand that we're here. And as beautiful as that is, conflict often arrives. Conflict happens, I recently, um, two weeks ago, I traveled to Nebraska with a black trans woman, her grandmother died. And everything is wonderful and hunky-dory, and we can be as political as we need to be until grandma dies and we've gotta go back to our home of origin. This is Enfield. Y'all are working really hard to create a town that has open arms for everyone. I want you to think about Carly and what we did a couple weeks ago and think about that piece of acceptance. So what happens when grandma dies? In what ways is your town celebrating pride is wonderful? In what ways is your town making it clear to the queer people in your community that there's space outside of pride? June is a whole lot of fun. June is a lot of fun. And actually I know from talking to some of your parents, you guys have some great books in some of the, in some of the school libraries, so that's happening. What are you doing to make sure that we've got space outside of the celebrations? Um, let's see, third one across is you've got someone who's from a mixed heritage background, who's that? Tell me about that. Oh, yes. Well, my different heritage is um, Indian and also English and German and French. How's that show for you? Maybe, well, I don't know, maybe my mouth. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, I 
think like with Indian, you got the pride, you're the first to come over, it's not, you, you got, you stand up, you got your voice, you know, when they do the Cherokee, you know, so I got my loud, I can't do that, I'm on Cherokee, I'm on, I forgot which one, but I got the mouth, I got the, whole, I got the loudness, just like the same. Generally, I really don't know much of uh, the background of that. French, yeah, definitely, yeah. Like my grandma was always very vocal, yeah. Oh, you want the mic back? That's it, that's it. And, th and, and thank you for taking us down that road. Now that one, quickly, this is one that I'm gonna ask folks to share with their folks who you're sitting with, um, because it's really easy to decide that white is a monolith, right? And I'm gonna challenge everyone in here, again, talking about identity, talking about privilege of voice, privilege of thinking about yourself a little bit more, um, that mixed heritage background. Some of us have it easy. Daddy, sharecropper, you know, sharecropping stock from Alabama, mama, white, philosophy, white lady from a gap, mixed heritage is right there. White people, what is your white? Both parents French? One parent French, one parent Polish? What is that? And so right now I want you to very quickly talk to the person who's next to you and talk about the mixes that dwell within your body. Right now, talk, so one thing that America has done, America has created this thing that is American whiteness. And American whiteness steals us all of our beauty. And American whiteness takes away ethnicity. So I'm asking folks to talk to the people who are next to you. What dwells within your body? What are the different bloods that live there? What are the different ethnicities that live there? What you got going on? Oh, y'all have a good conversation over here is a smile. Okay, let's call that one a day real quick. And on that one, th that's a place to check in. Think of the hands. Hands open, uh, feel it. Hands closed, mm, can't feel it. Hmm? Okay, so here, this is where we're gonna talk about privilege again. We're going right back to that place of privilege of knowledge of self. When you were discussing what was inside of you, who had a whole lot to say about what lives inside their body? About who lives, what, what streams, what strains? What ethnicities? Some of us have beautiful stories. Some of us love the story of our family. Um, what is it, 23 and Me? Um, DNA testing. This is created places where people are going down and figuring out their stories, figuring out where they're coming from, which is a whole lot of fun. When we talk about privilege and understand, I understand white privilege is a thing, it's a thing folks need to talk about, there are books written about it. When we come into one of these conversations, we are talking about the privilege of voice. And I really truly believe that folks whose identities are marginalized, people who are of mixed heritage backgrounds, people who do come from different spaces and different places, have a privilege of knowledge of self, okay? There's a privilege of knowledge of self. So when we come into these spaces and have conversations where we're all sharing different pieces of identity and we're all discussing issues of race, class, ethnicity, culture, queer issues, et cetera, the voices that we center in this space always are the voices of the marginalized. We understand that in these spaces, the voice of the marginalized carries weight because that's the privileged voice. Unfortunately, in many spaces, that voice isn't privileged. So. This can, thank you so much. We're gonna go through the rest in a bit. But if you can sit down, you can go now. <laughs> We're gonna, we're gonna hit a couple more of those boxes, but we got to that one, and I want to talk, so getting to that place of the privilege of the voice of the marginalized. And we're here because something really awful happened on August 13th that upset a whole lot of folks. 
And right now, before we go on, I want to hear from some folks here what happened, what you know that happened. Now, we talked about using the right language. We talked about using the language that we know. We talked about creating brave space. Right now, I would love to hear from someone what you believe happened on August 13th and why you're here tonight. Brave space, does anyone want to talk? Okay, I'm going to start here and then move back. I heard about what happened um, in the news. Um, I read that a student here at Enfield High was out for a fundraiser. And they walked up to one of the doors, and a resident um, chose to berate them and use racial slurs. And the reason that I'm here tonight is, on top of my work that I've always viewed as being a volunteer within the community, is I'm an educator. And I've worked with seventh graders, eighth graders, sixth graders, and they came from a lot of different backgrounds. And I worked um, most recently out in California. I worked in a district where about 60, 70 percent of our students were on free and reduced lunch. They came from first generation households, and they knew racism. And those were my kids. And then when I heard that it was someone that I knew, it was, I knew the mother of this child, that hurt. It killed me inside to know that it wasn't just about the news, it was the community, it was someone you knew, and it killed me as an educator to know that a student would be treated with such disrespect and such angst from someone in the community that I flew 2,000 miles from to come home to because I believed that it would be a safe place to go. I left this town because I felt that it was unsafe. And to see things like that in the news broke my heart. So that's why I'm here today. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for coming back and thank you for being here. Hands here and then back here. Hi. Um, I'm here because, one, I know the child that it happened to. This is a classmate of my daughter. Um, also because we happen to be parents of black children and I can very easily see this happening to my son who is bigger than the person that it happened to who I don't know if I've taught him well enough to be able to respond in a way that keeps him safe because it's not my experience I have not lived it I can't pick up on the signals that, oh my God, this person's about to go off. And having people like that in our town scares the crap out of me, not just for my kids, but for all the kids, including my, my, my daughter that, was, that is his classmate is white. She's seen her siblings get, excuse my language, but get racist shit from people. And it, hurts her spirit too. And if we can't face it, like you say, it's not these, all these big blatant things, which are horrible and which happen, obviously that's why we're here, but it's believing the lie that just because I'm white, I'm better than somebody. It's believing the lie that someone, racism is a lie that someone is less than because of their difference. And if we can't admit that we all have that within us, that where we come from, where we grew up, we've, those are our experiences that we draw from. What is familiar to us seems true. And if we're not willing to challenge that in ourselves and in others, we lose so much because there's, if, without diversity, nature dies. Without diversity, our community is going to die because there is so much to be brought forward from all different areas, all different life. Everybody has something to bring forward, and if we shut down and shut up segments, then we're all the poorer. Um, I am sitting here trying not to speak, trying so hard not to speak. Wow. 
because it's only a handful of black people in this room. But I have to speak because many people who don't know, and I'm not gonna share who I am, but this is why I show up to these places because black people aren't, don't feel safe to come to these things to make sure that their voice is heard. I found out because I'm part of a collective that includes people like you and Ivy and a friend of the mothers who's part of this collective, who's an organizer, reached out and said, yo, this just happened. Corinne, I need you to contact everybody you know. And even though I couldn't be there because I had to show up that same day at the beach, because two days before that, black people were kicked off the beach in Yemen Asset, so we had to do something on the beach to show our black faces. So I couldn't show up in Enfield on Sunday with mom and son, because we had to show our black asses up at the beach after the game kicked off. So I'm here, and I don't live in Enfield. And Connecticut is very funny. I wasn't born and raised in Connecticut. And Connecticut is very funny about outsiders. And why you don't live here? I live in Manchester, why are you here? Why? Why am I here? Because my daughter goes to Manchester High or went to Manchester High. We have to play racist ass Enfield. She stopped playing soccer because of towns, racist ass towns like Enfield and Summer, because she would usually be the only black girl on the field. So when I heard about it, I'm numb. As someone who's currently on, going through a trial of being a hate crime, I was like, when y'all gonna wake up? I think you showed up in Edmonton to end hate across the state, which we're still continuing that tour. And people wonder why you are doing end hate across the state. Because in every single town and city in Connecticut, there is a hate crime that is committed every day. And every single time it is committed, the police show up, and every single time the same way they showed up for the, the, to, here in Enfield. And every single time, it's usually a white woman who is doing something and saying something, and then she somehow makes it about herself and wants to become the victim. That's why I showed up. Because I'm not going to allow these things to continue to happen without someone who is loud, queer as hell and proud, black as hell, Panamanian, Jamaican, and Bayesian, and think that as an outsider, I'm not going to say nothing. No, I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up in Ellington, Enfield, Newington, Fairfield, Greenwich, Hartford, New Haven, Bridgeport. Whether you like it or not, I'm showing up. And if you see my post, absolutely. When I saw that fake account talk about they were going to get the Proud Boys, absolutely. And people are like, it's a fake account. No, it was a real person who didn't make the post. The account is fake, but the person is real. And I don't care if I am outnumbered. I'm going to show up. Proud Boys, uh, uh, whatever boys, whatever boys, men, I don't give a damn who you are. I don't care who you bring. I'm showing up. I'm showing up. I'm going to keep showing up. So to all of the black people in towns like Enfield who are afraid to show up, call me. Call me. I wasn't going to say who I was, but I'm going to show up for you. I'm going to show up for you. I'm going to show up with you. I'm going to show up beside you. I'm going to show up behind you. And for the people who are white who are feeling something, I'm going to shut up after this. I understand that you know them, but would you have shown up if you didn't know them? To all the people who raised their hand and they went to pride, did y'all go to Juneteenth? Are you challenging your teachers? Are you challenging your board of ed? Are you challenging your principal about what the curriculum is teaching? Are you making sure things are taught outside of black history? Because showing up today is a start, but not really, because it's 2022. You should have showed up in 1981. So for many black people, and you're looking in the wrong room, especially or any of you little r races, the microaggression races. Not you big r, I appreciate big r races, because I know who you are. It's you little r races. For all of you who are showing and saying, it's not that many black people, so it can't be a problem, shut the hell up. They don't feel safe. And for many of them, many of those black people are married to white people. And they have, they're in Boy Scout 
crafts, in Girl Scouts, in brownies, and they're a coach, and they're a teacher, and they know that they cannot show their black faces up to this because it is going to affect their socioeconomic status. It's going to fall, it's going to, it's going to affect their social status. And they don't have the means to pick up and move to a place like New Haven or a place like Philly where I'm from. So they have to stay here. And they do the best they can with what they got. But I'm going to show up. Very quickly, enter into Brave Space. And this is what needs to happen. And folks here who do facilitation, I want you to really pay attention to what just happened because someone took the mic and had the mic for a long time and that was necessary. Understand that in these spaces, we, we've got curated ways to allow people to share their voices, right? And we allow people to talk for maybe two or three minutes. And that's not a community conversation. That is a group thing where we all come in and are reminded the right way to act. And we understand that we don't say words like shit and fuck. And we understand that we don't call people out. And we understand that the right way to do this is to discuss euphemisms and discuss there's racism in our community, but we don't call out the actual thing that happened. And as we talk to that next box who's, who celebrates diversity, y'all just celebrate diversity. In space, we're in at 645, there's going to be a board of ed meeting. And at that board of ed meeting, there's this dude, Robert. People who have meetings fucking love Robert and his rules. And in that meeting, Robert and his rules are going to be greatly represented. And that's going to be the culture of that space. And it's going to make people in that space really happy. This, this type of space, we co-opt our community. We screw over our community members by expecting them to step into our well-behaved, Robert's rules happy community meetings. And as I said to Kelly, Kelly, I don't know how many times I've told you over the last couple days, your job today is not to be reasonable. Something awful and horrible will happen to your child. And as we look at what a culture in a town is, and as we look at what the climate in a town is, expecting a mother to hold it together, and definitely a white man, like, like if anyone here has read about double consciousness, let's take a second and think about what it is to be, to be an adult white woman and have to develop double consciousness, right? So we've got a woman here whose black sons were just threatened. And they were threatened in a way that black boys, black bodies are murdered daily in this country. And one of this woman's fears for the last few days has been that she wants to act right here now. One of her concerns is that she doesn't sound too passionate. As a mother in a community whose children's lives have been threatened, we somehow as a community have given her the impression that her job is to act right that if she yells and screams and cries and kicks and says this is wrong, we won't listen to her and won't believe her. As we talk about celebrating diversity, where is the diversity for the mother's pain? Where is there the diversity and space for true humanity in these spaces? Community conversations are wonderful, they're necessary, this is great. This conversation needs to continue out there and it needs to continue in your kitchen where it smells like you. It needs to happen at the Little League field, right? Where we don't want to discuss politics. It needs to happen at the football field, where we don't want to discuss politics, but when the, our children go from town to town, again, I was a little girl who played soccer in summers. Aside from everyone just knowing that I was Jamaican, because I was good, other than that, the number of people who knew it was okay to say really horrible, awful, racist things was disgusting. My coach knew his job was to tell me to ignore it. In 1988, one town over, whenever we would play, and it was rec, because you know, schools, for whatever reason, schools don't play, the, but the rec league did. We would come to Enfield. Little girls would call me Jigaboo. Jigaboo was the fun one back then in the 80s. But they would call me Jigaboo, and it was okay. Right now, before we break up, we're gonna break out into sessions very, very shortly. Um, but I want people to talk about what has changed and what has not changed. Again, I'm the outsider We're looking at the cobwebs. I can tell you in 1987, playing on the soccer fields right out here, I was called Jigaboo, and it was okay. Last week, a little black boy in this town was called Nigger. I don't know if that was okay or not. I'm from the outside. This is the place for you to have that conversation. 30 years difference, what has changed, what hasn't changed, and what's all right. Quickly have that conversation with the people next to you, and then we'll figure out how to go into the other room.
Has anything changed? Why not? Was it Reagan? Was it Bush? Was it Trump? Was it Obama? It's Saturday Night Live. So right now I want to acknowledge that the Board of Ed is leaving. They're going off in their meeting. Hopefully we've done a great job of centering folks. Have a great meeting, y'all. And honestly, I like the way you guys stack this. This is a great way to get people out on one night. Have like meeting after meeting after meeting. It's a great time. Okay, we're gonna come on back and hopefully we've got into a place of, boy, everything has changed, boy, nothing has changed, it's completely the same, it's completely different. Okay, so as I was throwing out all types of different ideas and scenarios, there is this, um, I'm gonna call y'all the amen corner, I've just made you the church people, so you're the amen corner, right? So, so the amen corner over here is I'm throwing, you know, was it MTV? I don't know, was it Saturday Night Live? What I kept hearing was fear. Fear, fear, fear. Now you touch my soul because I understand it's fear. Um, can we all come back really quick? We're gonna come here and then we're gonna go into the other room and have a conversation. Boy, this is a great prompt. You can hear my voice clap once. Hear my voice clap twice. Hear my voice clap three times. Awesome, beautiful, great to have everyone back. So. We are here and we've got issues and we've got problems and we have this catalyst. We've got a young man on the football team who is made to feel incredibly unsafe in this community and right now there's an understanding that he still isn't safe, that the community hasn't created a place of safety for him. And outside of him, and just as we heard, other marginalized human beings in this community are not here. Other voices choose not to come to these places because they don't feel safe. They're scared about retaliation. Now, what we've identified so far. Y'all passionate, huh? You care. That's awesome. You gotta talk in a little while, not yet. Okay, so we're gonna send you guys off into another room to talk. So this is where we are, right? Um, because all oppression is connected, all issues are connected, I do not believe in any way we can talk about education without, there's, there's no way you can talk about anything happening in America without discussing policing, right? This is the thing. Um, and here we are in this town where a, a civic engagement, right? What, like this is, this is some Mayberry stuff. The football team gets together, they're gonna go sell these rap, like it is beautiful. This is what small town America is supposed to do. Whenever we hear about what America should be, whenever someone who's like 80 years old decides to tell us about how great their life was, it's that story of what happened, right? But it doesn't end with racial epithets being thrown at children by full grown adults. Here it did. So we've got the school issue, right? We definitely have the education issue. We've got a group of students taking part in extracurricular activities for all of the right beautiful reasons, and this got tossed out. Now, there is a place inside of me that I, that I do say, Whew, awesome. The fact that it had to happen, these things happen, but it happened to a young man who, who belongs to a team. Because I know teams care about each other. And I know coaches care a whole lot about bringing teams together. And I don't play sports for nothing because I'm not down with competition. But I can appreciate what happens there. So I want to believe that the football coach and his staff is figuring out how to create a place where these other young men can support this young man. That's beautiful. 
I hope the teachers in schools are doing that. I hope the school board, no, the school board just walked out. I hope the folks in the school building are thinking about what they're going to do. And I hope that that conversation definitely includes the SROs, the school resource officers. I'm a black woman in America. I'm the mother of two sons. I can tell you, and this is the important part as we step into this conversation, right? I don't really think police officers belong in schools. I look at the numbers and it scares me. I look at many, many, many young black men who end up being late just a little too often, who end up in in-school suspension, who then mouth off at a teacher, who then find themselves in jail for 30 days, who then find themselves in jail for six months. I did not make any of that up. I did not make any of that up. I did not make any of that up. That is where I'm coming from. There's a lot of heads nodding. Are there SROs in the school here? Okay, guess what, this is the hard part. Are they going to leave the school tomorrow? No. Are there people in this town, so that we've got the, the um, sorry, we've got the police department here, we've got the chief here. Are you comfortable with, with SROs and school resource officers in the schools? Okay, here we are. This is the important work, this is the hard work, and this is where I love my work, right? Because the chief of police is not going to convince me that SROs in the school is great. I am not going to convince law enforcement that the SROs have to go tomorrow. How are we gonna make this work? This is why I love my job. I don't have an answer. That's your job. So what's about to happen is you're going to go into the, di into the dining room, into the cafeteria. You're going to break up, there's gonna be six groups, but there's gonna be three topics. One topic is education. If you know a lot about education, do not go to that table. You're a waste of time there, don't go there. The other table, so it's three groups, right? One group's education, another group is policing. If you know a whole lot about law enforcement and policing, don't go there. That's not the place for this, that, for this conversation tonight, right? Tonight, we're talking about how we feel. Tonight, we're talking about what we think should be. I don't need a reasonable person in that conversation saying, well, that's a really good idea. You know state statute 8742 and some other dumb crap means that it can't happen. I don't care about that tonight, okay? That's three meetings from now. As we said, this is the first. Three meetings from now start talking about what is realistic. Today, talk about your hopes and dreams and beauty. So again, fear came up. What is it that keeps us from evolving? Fear. What is one of those fears? Talking about your beautiful, outrageous ideas that beautiful, reasonable people know are outrageous. I think everyone should have a house for free. That's kind of awesome. You're not supposed to say it out loud, right? You know, so do you think that no one should pay rent? Like, do you think everyone should just live for free? You clearly don't think everyone should just have a house for free. Yes, I do. Yep. How's it gonna happen? I don't know. But I'm sharing with you my hopes and dreams. So, the conversation that you're going to have, people who know a lot about education, come out of your, your comfort zone, go talk about policing. People who know a lot about policing, come out of your comfort zone, go talk about education. And then the third group is the great unknown. Because there's a whole bunch of people in here right now who know, okay, you can talk about police all you want. That ain't gonna do it. You can talk about education all you want. That ain't gonna do it. Okay, so what is gonna do it? Go to the third group. So, right now there are beautiful people. Um, facilitator scribes, hands up. So the town of Enfield has, has very graciously and wonderfully required these people to work overtime tonight. Tessa, thank you so much. And they are going to be facilitating and leading these groups. So when you go into the cafeteria, go find a table. You've got the sheets up with the names of the groups, right? They don't? Okay, go. They're going to go to get them right in right now. Go into the cafeteria. Go find a group where you are not an expert in the subject matter, and I'll meet you in there shortly. And if anyone finds it in cell phone and iPhone, please let me know.